Greetings. My name is Guy Dauncey. This is the show called Change the World, where I like to take some of the really big issues that we're grappling with as a planet that cause some of us to really feel in despair and hopeless and look at the big, exciting solutions that people are coming for and how we're going to tackle these things and change the world for better. One of the big crises we're dealing with, as we all know, is the climate crisis, or as I have taken to calling it, the climate emergency. And among the whole host of ways dealing to tackle that is the issue of how do we stop investing in fossil fuels? My guest today, James Rowe, welcome to the show. Thank you. Is um, working on this thing full time. I'll come to that in a second. Let me just introduce James first. He was born in Edmonton, moved to Victoria for university when you were 18, worked in Edmonton over the summer canvassing for Greenpeace, writing reports for the Toxic Watch Society of Alberta, then moved to California to do graduate school in political science at the University of California, came back to Victoria, teaching at UVic in environmental studies. You finished a dissertation for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Two primary research interests, one, this thing of fossil fuel divestment, and the other one, which I hope we'll get to, the growing use of mind-body practices like meditation and yoga within our social movements. So we're all calm and blissed out while we're taking on the big challenge, right? Exactly, exactly. So tell me your take on the climate crisis before we get into divestment. Yeah. Well, I think the most useful place to start is that we've tended to talk about the climate crisis, the climate emergency as something that's coming. Yes. Uh, that's uh, future tense. Yeah. Uh, but as we got a taste of quite literally this summer, it's, wow. it's present tense. Yes. Um, and it's tense. <laughs> and I, live it's in the, I live in the forest. Right. All through the summer, I'm conscious that in five minutes notice, there can be a fire and I have to evacuate and lose my house. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, here on the coast, we were choking on smoke for um, many weeks. Yes. And then those in the interior were actually having to be evacuated from their yeah. homes due to these wildfires that uh, were just devastating. Um, and it's completely predicted uh, yeah. by climate modeling that as, as we see warming and then with uh, the mountain pine beetle that itself uh, was facilitated by warmer winters that allowed it to decimate our forest, making them basically a matchbox. They normally need minus 40 temperature to mm -hmm. kill off the beetle. Yeah. It hasn't been minus 40 in Prince George for 30 years. No, exactly. So, so the conditions are ripe for exactly what we saw this summer. Unfortunately, yeah. it's predicted to get worse, uh, not better. And then similarly with uh, the superstorms yeah. uh, that we saw on the East Coast, uh, Irma. And, uh, and they're fed because the water is so much warmer. So it picks up the energy to exactly. go into the hurricane. Exactly. So we're seeing, so climate change is here. So flip to the fundamental causes as you see it. Uh, well, it's, it's the burning of, of fossil fuels, uh, yeah. which creates uh, potent greenhouse gas emissions that yeah. uh, result in the so-called greenhouse effect that traps heat and, and then results in, in all of the destabilization yeah. that we're, that we're that seeing. Because all that ancient carbon that was laid down 200 million years ago mm -hmm. has stored solar energy. Exactly. Yeah. It is the consumption of fossil fuels that's yes. the primary uh, cause. And fossil fuels can't develop without investment. Yeah, exactly, so. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, so, so, so the strategy of fossil fuel divestment arose uh, about five years ago now, and the, the sort of purpose behind it was to break the political deadlock on climate change in that we've been aware of this concern for many years now. Uh, many high-level reports through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change at the UN, policymakers have known about this for years. Yes. No action. Yes. Um, we had the really devastating uh, meetings in Copenhagen in 2010 where there's expectations of a, of a profound climate plan and, and It nothing. all fell apart and we all got terminally depressed for a year. Exactly. But anyways, the theory behind divestment is that uh, fossil fuel companies are one of the primary reasons we haven't seen action. These are some of the wealthiest companies in the world. Yeah. Exxon is, in fact, the wealthiest company in the world. And uh, they've mobilized their vast resources to... Uh, lobby governments to uh, push back against climate legislation yes. and also to fund climate denial. Most, most of the climate denial work, if you scratch it, mm -hmm. it goes back to money from the oil industry and the exactly. coal industry. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So uh, Exxon has been recorded to have spent uh, about $35 million allocated to 60 different organizations that sowed out on climate change. Yeah. So it's a bit like the smoking thing. Well, maybe the science isn't clear. We need right. more research. Don't do anything yet. That's right. And the whole purpose of sowing doubt is that it makes it harder for legislators to pass the needed policy yes. because the public is confused. You know, they're, they're actually, well, it's not clear this yes. is a problem. You know, yeah. so, 
So with, with fossil fuel divestment, the goal is to um, culturally marginalize the fossil fuel industry, to make them a moral pariah. Yes. Uh, in that, uh, you know, the sort of motto of fossil fuel divestment is that if it's wrong to wreck the climate, then it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. Yes. And uh, these companies are trying to profit from uh, the extraction and burning of fossil fuels, which we just have to be ramping yeah. down. I see it as similar to investing in the slave trade 200 years ago, where yeah. slaves were our energy then. That's right. Is that a fair analogy or not? Uh, yeah, no, I think, I, think it is, I think it is a fair analogy. And, and we, once we knew that how horrible the slave trade was, yeah. the boats were still running, people were still investing and making money from it. Yeah. Yeah, it, it um, you know obviously in terms of the personal toll that's wrought from being a slave, uh, you know I don't want to belittle no. that. It's, yeah. it's that's profound. Uh, but no, in terms of it being the same energy source and yes. and working to divest from yes. uh, from that industry, it, it makes perfect sense as so a corollary. How has the divestment movement progressed from the beginning theme to where it is today? Yeah, well, it's seen really rapid growth. It's the fastest growing divestment movement in history. Um, at this point, uh, there are over um, well, roughly 800 organizations or institutions that have divested. Uh, that, and these 800 institutions are worth a total of about $5 trillion. And so okay. it's $5 trillion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a thousand times more than $5 billion. That's yeah. a very large amount of money. Yeah, and, and to be clear, that's not the amount that's been divested, but okay. that's the, uh, the wealth of the institutions that themselves have divested. Um, okay. Like they're they're worth. Uh, uh, okay. So, so worth. the actual do we do we know the total money that's we been? We don't know the total amount, but it's in the billions, right. uh, for sure. Uh, in that we've also have fifty thousand individuals that have divested as well. Yeah. That have a collective worth of five billion. And so how does that work at a, a university like UVic, where they obviously have endowments and yeah. money set aside and it's invested? Mm -hmm. uh, is UVic invested in fossil fuels? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> what percentage of its portfolio, any idea, would be yep. tied up with? Yeah, I can tell you, nine percent of the nine. of the university's endowment. Right. And so the endowment is is this fund that gets populated by donations over the years, and then they invest this fund, and they use it to fund student programming and, and other activities yeah. on campus. It's at this point, it's worth about four hundred and twenty million dollars. Yeah, I mean, every university needs that yep. endowment fund. Oh yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes. There's nothing wrong with having the fund. Uh, we just want them to divest from fossil fuels because UVic presents itself as a climate change leader, as a sustainability That's, leader, yeah. and it's hypocritical for them to be trying to profit from Imperial Oil, yes. uh, which is a subsidiary of Exxon, which, as we know, has spent millions funding climate change denial. Yes. And so there's hypocrisy there. So how does it go if you want to persuade UVic to divest? What are the steps you have to take or have been taken? <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so far uh, we've had uh, a faculty vote. So UVic faculty voted on divestment, and uh, roughly 67% of faculty voted in favor of fossil fuel divestment. So that's a strong majority by, by any standards. Strong majority. And what was also impressive is that we were voting not only on divesting the endowment, but we were voting on divesting our pension fund as well. So it's uh, personal. So we were putting our money in where yes. our mouth is so as, it, as it goes. Uh, and so that's it, two thirds of all faculty mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. all disciplines mm -hmm. are saying, stop doing this. Yeah. Exactly. So then what happens when the vote comes through? Uh, nothing. <laughs> What's the next level of, of decision making? Uh, well, well I'll, I'll just continue with okay. the, the, the students themselves voted as well. And 77% right. uh, of students voted in favor of divestment. Okay. Um, and a number of staff unions have also pledged support. Uh, QP4163 that represents teaching assistants and uh, and also the union that represents professional workers on campus have pledged their, right. their support. So all of the major constituencies on campus have declared their support yes. for divestment, but the administration still won't, uh, won't budge. So does the administration have any degree of democracy in how its representatives get selected? Um, yeah, there's, there's a board of governors uh, that's partly appointed by the university, some appointed by the government, uh, and some voted on uh, yes. as well. Uh, when it comes to the endowment board, uh, it's appointed by the university and it's, it's, uh, it's not particularly democratic. So it's not appointed by the Board of Governors, it's appointed by some administration? Uh, no, it's, it, it is appointed by the Board of Governors. Okay. Yeah. So what does it take to get a motion to the Board of Governors to vote on a thing like this? Uh, we've tried. 
Uh, we've tried. And they won't accept the motion at no, all? No, they haven't even said no, uh, They have because they don't want to vote on it, because they don't want to say no, <laughs> because that would look bad, uh, but nor do they want to say yes. And what's interesting is that we met um, in the spring with the chair of the foundation board, uh, the, the board that governs the endowment. Yes. And we were asking her just in a conversation like this, why? You know, why, yes. why, why won't you divest? Uh, are you worried about the financial piece? Are you worried about yes. the endowment not being You're able gonna to- You're going to lose some money or something like that. Are you worried? And, and the answer is no. Uh, because there's been a lot of research to show that funds that divest will do as well, if not better. And of course, there's research out now by Corporate Knights, a, a magazine out east, showing that UVix actually lost $7 million on their fossil fuel investments since the oil price crash in 2014. So there, you know, the sort of irony is that our motto is, is if it's wrong to wreck the climate, it's wrong to profit from that wreckage. UVix is not even profiting from these investments at this point. They're losing money. And so, so again, she said, no, the financial piece isn't the concern. Our concern is that we will be perceived as too political. And, and so we don't want to uh, take a political stand. And, our counter argument is that, well, you already are. That is a political stand mm -hmm. to not act on it. It's a, it's a stand to not act on it, and it's also a stand to invest millions of dollars in Imperial Oil that's a subsidiary of Exxon, which is a known climate change yeah. denier. So you're, you're standing with Exxon uh, before you're standing with your own students and faculty. Do you have access to the alumni who made the donations, who put the money into the the fund so that no. they could write letters and say this is our money you're investing right yeah no uh the university isn't keen to share their, <laughs> their donor list well uh, i could see us. that maybe yeah uh but we uh, i'll just alert to your viewers that we are launching a, a general petition uh in that again as students and faculty we yes. voted but we're going to try to harness the larger public in in british columbia to voice their opinion as well and and we encourage alumni and donors to so sign on to that how is the same story unfolded at ubc simon fraser university of northern bc uh, i don't know the story at unbc um, but i know that there have been robust movements at sfu and ubc uh, ubc voted no so they actually did t t t the board took a vote so the board took a vote so they weren't afraid of being political at ubc well yeah exactly Exactly. <laughs> so they, they took a vote and the, and, and the answer was, was no. And what about the Harvards and Princetons and T University of Torontos and people? Yeah, so uh, I guess the, the, uh, the biggest name Ivy League university that's divested is Stanford, yes. uh, divested from coal. Um, not quite Ivy League, but the University of California system that I yes. <laughs> emerged out of, uh, the largest public system in the U.S., they divested from tar sands. Uh, so okay. these are targeted divestments, not complete. Okay, they're but getting there step by step. And they uh, divested on purely financial grounds. It wasn't moral. Yeah. And they've saved themselves millions of dollars because they divested before the price crash. Right. Uh, and so that was a brilliant move on just purely economic <laughs> grounds. Uh, on the Canadian scene, uh, the University of Toronto president uh, launched a, a, a sort of expert committee to look into the yes. issue. And they came back with an opinion that the University of Toronto should divest. Um, but then he said no. <laughs> so he decided to disregard uh, the opinion from his own expert committee. Um, and the only, at this date, uh, while 35 universities in the US have divested, only one in Canada has uh, gone for, for complete divestment. That's Laval. So we've got uh, a long way to go then. We do, yeah. Do any of the universe, is, does, well, let me free, rephrase this, does any of the debate also focus around reinvesting in yeah. renewable energy? Absolutely. Uh, because again, if, if universities simply divest from fossil fuels and buy into weapon manufacturers, <laughs> then you know, what, yes. what gains have been made. And so our argument is absolutely they should be investing in, um, in green energy as much as yeah. they can or, and uh, sustainability or businesses that have a sustainability uh, outlook. And you know there have been estimates done on the trillions of investment that's required for us yeah. to power financially power the energy massive energy transition yes. that's, that's so needed. getting in early you'd have thought would be a, a good move yeah and this you know like like with all companies on the stock market not every single renewable energy company you invest in is going to make yeah. uh, a killing but you, you we know that this has to be for us to survive as a species i'm sorry to put it so so starkly but it's it's the case we need to have a massive energy transition yeah. 
and, and so it just makes utter sense to be uh, moving your dollars now into, I find uh, that into these firms. The technological, the technological transition argument is mm. easier to work with people than sometimes the climate emergency argument. So mm. like in 1890, the streets were just full of horses and carriages. Right. By 1920, we'd all moved on to cars. Yeah. And we did that transition. So it's almost as if the fossil fuel people are saying, no, no, we're not going to do a new transition. We're going to keep on burning oil forever. Exactly. This technology change doesn't exist anymore. Exactly. And that these Tesla cars and that they're, they're just the little hippies or something. Where exactly. in reality, now recently, Volkswagen has said they're moving, I think, to 100% electric. Volvo, all their vehicles are going to be electric. Mm -hmm. Norway is saying the whole vehicle fleet will be electric by 2030. Yeah. France said the whole vehicle fleet by 2040. Germany the same, I think. So we know this huge transition is coming. Exactly, and, and then the argument is, is that you, you combine the technological change with the climate legislation that has to happen for us to avoid yeah. surpassing two degree warning, warming and the, to use the technical language, catastrophic warming that yes. will or climate change that will result from that. Uh, we know that we need legislation that's gonna raise the price of, of, of carbon and yeah. is gonna make the business model of companies like Exxon less profitable. Uh, so you combine the technological change with uh, the fact that their costs are going to go up and they're going to be losing even more money than yeah. we saw with the drop in 2014. And so it makes sense from our perspective to get out soon and to transition your finances yeah. uh, in this other, uh, this other direction. So the petition is the big next step forward for you, Vic. Yeah. Are you planning to get some mayors and councillors hopefully signing that? And yeah. Th some business leaders in Victoria? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because the thing with divestment is that it's really interesting. There's, there's the moral case, with, yes. which I've already articulated with that little punchy line, it's wrong to wreck the climate, wrong to profit from that wreckage. Yes. But then there's also just the financial argument. Um, and I can go into it, this argument around the carbon bubble and stranded assets, if you like, yes. it's a little <laughs> arcane. But the basic argument is, is that uh, the value of these companies is overinflated and it's going to drop profoundly in the coming well, My reading years. of it is as the electric vehicle movement really takes hold, mm -hmm. there's going to be that just drop in the oil supply, yeah. in the oil demand, I should say. That's right. As the demand drops, the price can fall through the floor because the yeah. price of oil is the future price. Mm -hmm. We're going to see oil down to $20 a barrel and a lot of companies going bankrupt. Yeah, no, a I lot think. of shares plunging, a lot of investment value being stranded, as you say. No, exactly. So, so it's interesting being involved in this movement in that, you know, I, I've received calls from a number of asset managers. You know, yes. so uh, there's a, a fund managed out of CIBC here in in um, Victoria that called me up uh, because they wanted to talk because I think they ultimately want Uvic's business because they operate a fossil free fund. They, they, there's, there's money to be had in this. Yes. And so uh, it's not just your classic environmentalist crowd yeah. that's attracted to the investment issue. There's also a, a large swath of the finance industry that's, yeah. uh, that's very interested in this yeah. uh, approach. So um, a quick diversion in a minute. We're familiar with the term of climate denier. Yeah. Recently I've heard the term being used as climate alarmist, that you and okay. I are accused of being climate alarmists. Right. What's your response to that? Um, well, I would argue that that itself is, is a version of climate denial. You know, yeah. in, the, in that if you look at the science and then you explore your phenomenological felt reality like we did this, this summer, yeah. uh, it's terrifying. Yeah. You know, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't like to be dour, uh, yeah. but, but it's, it's frightening. And, and, uh, and so the only rational response at, at this front is, is to raise the alarm. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I'm known as being Mr. Positive and mm -hmm. cheerful and stuff like that, but yeah. I have a saying that if you think you've understood climate change mm -hmm. and you haven't had that sinking feeling in the pit of your belly, like, oh my God, this is really, really serious, yeah. then you haven't understood the crisis properly. No, I think so. And 41% like of climate scientists when asked to describe the future do use the word catastrophic. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So, in, but instead of saying it's all hopeless, I say, well, the, the more determined we need to become to accelerate divestment and reinvestment mm -hmm. in the solutions and do this transition. Exactly, and the thing that's useful about divestment is that it, it, uh, it names uh, it, it names the source of the problem. Uh, yeah. We all use fossil fuels, and so in some respects we're all complicit at some level, but I have 
no particular interest in what energy source I use. I just want energy. Yes. Uh, whereas fossil fuel companies, they have a deep self-interest in us continuing to use this very energy source that is threatening the yeah. sustainability of the species. Because they personally profit from they it. They profit from it. Yeah. And, and so that's why they funded denial. That's why they fund lobbyists to yeah. uh, slow down climate legislation. And so they need to be called out. And that's what the divestment movement is stri what about, striving um, to do. Not to put them on the spot, but I'm doing that right now. The Victoria Foundation, mm. do they have a similar um, portfolio, including fossil fuels? That's a good question. I, I don't know what, uh, uh, what their mix uh, yeah. looks like. You know, as a Canadian investor, uh, given uh, the proportion, like uh, roughly oil and gas makes up around 20% of the Toronto Stock Exchange. Okay. Uh, and so the Canadian investor, it's pretty hard to uh, not have it in your portfolio. Yeah becoming a lot easier as these new fossil free funds emerge but my guess is they probably do well i'm 100 percent divested and i have been for about 10 years you know yeah. working with frank arnold he's my advisor in town he go. specializes in portfolios that are completely free of fossil yeah, fuels I'm glad you gave frank a shout out uh, yeah, yeah he well he and stephen work. whip are two of the main exactly. leaders in town for helping individual people yeah. divest personally right exactly yeah and advanced city similarly has a fossil free fund and so uh, yes. and this blue heron uh, group at cibc as mentioned earlier have a fossil what free is fund. the blue heron group uh, it's uh, an asset manager out of CIBC that okay. uh, have a, have a uh, it's a fossil, actually they have a uh, very powerful ethical screens that they yes. use on their investments that screen out all fossil fuel right. investment along with a number of other bads that you might right. want so to am I avoid. right that there's a bigger movement brewing around looking at the impact of fossil fuel companies on politics yeah. in general? Yeah. Tell me about that. Uh, well, I can speak to uh, this um, project that I'm involved in uh, right now, the Corporate Mapping Project. Corporate Mapping. Mm -hmm. It's a joint uh, initiative between the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives uh, in BC and the Parkland Institute in Alberta yes. and then University of Victoria, okay. researchers here. Uh, and we're investigating the uh, role that the fossil fuel industry has played in obstructing climate legislation. Oh, wow. In um, Canada or in BC or across North America? Mostly Western Canada. Okay. Uh, and the big finding that came out recently that you may have seen is that uh, you know, Christy Clark struck this expert climate leadership committee yes. to come up with a, 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 a climate yeah, plan. the leadership team. The leadership team uh, got wonderful recommendations from them. Yeah. Uh, but then subsequently, uh, her government went to Calgary and had... Uh, meetings with the Canadian Association for Petroleum Producers in their boardroom in yes. Calgary and had the industry basically write the climate policy. And so this whole climate leadership plan was just smoking mirrors. Well, I mirrors. remember when, when the climate strategy came out, this is talking history now because it was under Christy Clark's leadership. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the climate strategy promised something like a 50% reduction. Yeah. And then I looked at it slice by slice by slice. And at the most, it was 5% yeah. over 30 years. Yeah. There was nothing in it apart from tree planting. Yeah, exactly. No, exactly. It's embarrassing. It was embarrassing, yeah. And, and again, if Albertans found out that their environmental policy was written in Victoria... They'd be pretty... Uh, oh, no, my gosh. They'd be, uh, they'd be the... Yeah, it'd be pitch, scandal. Pitch be huge. Pitch be huge. Pitchforks, yes. Uh, and so it's a bit surprising to me so far that there hasn't been as much outrage here as when we learned that our environmental policy has been written in the boardrooms of fossil fuel Yeah, I saw uh, the story in National in Observer on the Smog blog. Yep. For viewers, those are two, National Observer and mm -hmm. the Smog blog are two good sources to follow exactly. stuff. But it hasn't, did it hit the Vancouver Sun? It did, yeah, there, there's an article there. And, yeah. um, but again, just an example of the way that the industry is able to wield their uh, vast resources and, and often have their way, you know, and that you and I yeah. can't afford to have full-time lobbyists in Victoria or Ottawa yeah. uh, having the ears of government, whereas, uh, you know, Suncor is the largest lobbyist in the country and, yeah. and they have millions of dollars to spend on having yeah. the people there full-time having nice lunches and chats with, yeah, uh, well, with our government yeah. uh, officials. So. so change of gear entirely. I asked you if you wanted to bring a book in with you that yes. you felt was inspiring that you'd like to share with our viewers. Yeah. Uh, so the book is called Smile at Fear. Uh, Smile at Fear. Yeah, and it's, it's I think, fitting given the many challenges yes. that uh, we face today. It's written by mm -hmm. a gentleman named Chogyam Trungpa, who's a Tibetan uh, philososer and, right, well -known and teacher. Buddhist. Yeah, yes. a well-known Buddhist why, philosopher. Why do you find this inspiring? Uh, I find it inspiring because uh, we have so many challenges before us today, climate change being um, one of the most yes. more profound. And it's easy to feel overwelmed and yeah. uh, decentered and anxious 
uh, amidst all of these challenges. And what I like about this book, and you can get a sense of it with the title, Smile at Fear, yes. is that for one, it, it encourages us to see our fear as actually a natural response. Yeah. You know, we don't have to get down on ourselves for feeling anxious. It's actually uh, rational yes. <laughs> to feel anxious. Yeah. And so we can just sort of honor that, that anxiety that we feel, smile we don't, don't at it. Don't punish ourselves personally as if, it, yeah. Exactly. But then the other key point that Trunkwa makes is that if we look close enough at our basic situation, uh, it's, it's good. You know, our life on this planet as human beings uh, is actually wonderful. You know, we have all the food that we need, the, the, the water that we need, we have companionship. Uh, with yes. great capacity for pleasure. Like our fundamental situation here is very good. Yes. And uh, remembering that amidst all of the challenges that we face provides me with a lot of buoyancy oh. and, and uh, hope yeah. uh, moving forward. And, and again, there's so many social challenges that we face and we talk about wanting to change the world, which is so important. Yeah. But it's useful to sometimes recall that the world that we want is, is always here at all yes. times. It's a beautiful place that we inhabit. Yeah. We keep our hearts warm and not let them get all freaked out and disturbed. Exactly. And so moving forward with that sort of fundamental confidence in ourselves and in our basic uh, earthly condition can provide us with the energy uh, to solve many of these profound so, challenges. So we've got to wind up. So let me do uh, invite you to speak straight to camera for, sure. uh, for a couple of minutes and just share from your heart what's going on. Yeah. Uh, which camera am I going to speak to? Yeah, this one that here? one right there. Okay. Um, well, I uh, teach a class up at UVic called Mindfulness and uh, Social Change, where we explore the intersections between uh, mind-body practices like meditation and larger uh, social or structural uh, transformation. And so in my remaining minute or so, uh, I just want to share a really simple grounding exercise that viewers can use if you're feeling frayed and, and stressed out either by the political scene uh, or by a fear of flying or, uh, or intense traffic or whatever it might be and something that you can always do. And it's simply taking either of your hands and placing them on uh, your chest and uh, literally feeling your, your heart. And it's just a way of being with yourself in a really gentle and caring way with the premise being that if we're gentle and caring with ourselves, then we're going to be gentle and caring with others as well. So that's where some of the political impact of these basic centering practices can emerge from. But I just encourage you to, to do this and feel your hand touching your chest, feel your chest reaching out and touching your hand. It's an embrace. Uh, it's very soothing and calming. Uh, you can do it uh, again in traffic. You can do it on the plane. You can do it in a meeting without your coworkers probably thinking you're too strange. It's not that uh, odd of a of a hand gesture. So I just offer that as, as a tool uh, to help us all stay centered amidst uh, many of these uh, challenges that we face. And again, the more centered we can be as we try to address them, then the better our solutions and, and actions will be. So. Well, that's great. So let me put my hand up here yeah. and the other one here to thank you for your leadership in this whole thing, for giving people hope, inspiration, for showing some activism to make a change and make changes in the world that we need. Yeah, my pleasure. Right back at you, Guy. You've been a leader in the Victoria community for years, and so it's an honor getting to be here and talk to you about these important issues. Thank you. So um, my name is Guy Dornsey. This has been the show called Change the World. Um, one of my contributions to this is a, a book I wrote called Journey to the Future, A Better World is Possible, which takes all these great ideas and puts them into a novel in a fictional scenario in the year 2032 in Vancouver, imagining just what an amazing world we can produce if we all work together. If you like this kind of show, tune in next week and we'll have another scintillating guest and thanks for watching.